The Sound Off Podcast. The podcast about broadcast with Matt Kundal. Starts now. This week I'm speaking with Tara Sands. She's the voice you just heard, provided you didn't fast forward over the intro. If you did that, please restart the show in order to get the full Tara Sands experience. I was first introduced to Tara Sands through Kyle Taylor who was at The Edge in 2013 and is now actually doing imaging at Indy 88 in Toronto. Anyhow, we were looking for a new imaging voice. And he sent me something like this. One thousand dollars. Take a chunk off your credit card. Go nuts on iTunes. Think about how much canned ham that is. Hey, it's your thousand dollars. Spend it how you like. New alternative now. Not six months from now. This this is new alternative. A new edge recipe. Smashing pumpkins pie. Mmm, mmm, you can really taste the Billy Corgan. The edge. And then I thought, that sounds cool. So we hired her. It's one thing to see the band. It's another... To meet the band, Power 97 presents The Black Keys, October 25th at MTS Center. Win tickets to the show by identifying this off-key Black Keys song. Tara also does voice imaging for CHR stations. Your Snapchat story looks like you had a rough weekend. (laughs) Hydrating you with commercial-free music. It's the unofficial kickoff of summer. So Monday, we are officially slacking off. 101.5 WBNQ. Throwback Thursday. And country stations. When the lights come on and the crowd roars, be there to witness Jason Aldean live with 101.9 The Buzz. Get your hands on tickets all week. But radio imaging is just one part of the many ways she uses her voice. She's best known in Anglophone countries as the voice of Bulbasaur in the long-running Pokemon series. And there are endless credits on the Internet Movie Database for television, anime, cartoons, and so much more. She's also a voice you might hear on audiobooks, and now, podcasts. Tara Sands joins me from her home studio in Los Angeles. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. How much that is written about you on the Internet is true? Oh, that's a good question. I'd say most is true. They get some of the characters I've played over the years wrong because I've been doing this long enough that there was no IMDb when I started. So there's some misinformation about what characters I played. And I don't. uh, So one of the shows I worked on for many years was Pokemon. I'm miscredited as playing a bunch of roles and I'm doing a a comic convention next week. And they put a character I didn't play on my poster. And I was like, oh, guys, I didn't play that. Because then sometimes what happens is someone will bring me like a picture of that character to sign. And then I have to disappoint them and be like, the Internet's wrong. I didn't play that. (laughs) Should they check IMDb for the correct information? It's mostly correct. But it's IMDb is so weird because... They let people add stuff without verifying it, but then getting stuff taken off is really difficult. So there were like a bunch of roles that I knew I didn't play that I tried for years to get taken off of there. I don't know how I eventually got it done, but I mean, again, it took years. And some of the shows are so old that I don't remember if I worked on them. I guess I should go back and watch because sometimes I go in for like an hour and do some like small characters. And again, I didn't take notes back then. I wish I did. How many entries are there for you up there? It's like pages and pages. I don't know. I mean, it's not insane. But you think about it compared to like an on-camera actor, voice acting work for cartoons, we're not in there as much. So like even if I just did one episode of something, that's another entry. Whereas that same entry for an on-camera job would have been a lot more work, (laughs) let's say. Not that it's not hard work, but again, I can be credited for a job that took me an hour. That's not happening in the on-camera world. And then there's jobs that, you know, that I've done for years, and that's just one entry in there. You know, it evens out. I've seen you joke before that you get paid to do what you used to get in trouble in school (laughs) for, and that's talk. So did you talk a lot in school? Yes, I talked a lot. I I don't know what I had to say that was so important. Uh, I'm sure it was nothing that crucial that I needed to get out. But I've always just, I mean, you can tell I'm rambling right now. Like when I was even a little kid, I talked like I loved imitating commercials. So, yeah. So I used to get detention for talking too much. 
If they only knew, <laughs> then how I'm paid to talk too much. What was life growing up like in the uh, 80s and 90s in New Jersey? Jersey. Well, big hair. That's the most important part. Lots of hairspray. It was great. I mean, I lived close enough to New York that I I felt really lucky to to have access to th- great theater and things like that that I think really shaped me. And then I was able to, because I was so close to New York, start auditioning um, when I was in high school. Luckily, my parents were, I begged my parents to let me. They did, They were not pushing this on me at all. But yeah, being near New York, it was sort of the best of both. I could have like a backyard to run around in and then get to the city really easily. How does anybody know at that age, I want to go voice commercials. I want to be the voice of something in particular. I mean, oh, no, I did not. No. <laughs> I didn't know what a voiceover was. I was a theater kid. So you were going to New York to uh, for acting auditions. Yeah. So I was in like a local singing competition. That's how I even met my first manager. And the first audition she sent me on happened to be for a voiceover. Like, I, you know, that was just in addition to whatever else I was auditioning for. But that was the first thing I auditioned for through them and booked. I had already been doing some theater in New York and some singing stuff. Uh, you know, so I got that first job. It was I was like, what is this? What am I doing? <laughs> and I just really liked being in the studio. You know, when they came up, I would do them. It wasn't until many years later that I was like, I think I only want to do this job, this part of the the acting world. What was your first job? Uh, it was a wart commercial. It was for wart cream. Very f- fancy first job. I think I said something like, ew, gross, a wart. Um, I think it was a demo. I'm sure it didn't. It probably never aired. But yeah, I was like, wait, that's all I, 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 that's it. I'm done. (laughs) And it was fun. I was in the booth with someone else. Like we got to play off of each other. I think it was like, I wish I could remember who. Like to this day, I mean, I, I, there's something, you know, cause we're not wearing costumes when we're voice acting. The headphones to me are sort of my transition. Like, okay, now I'm in work mode. Now I'm whatever. Like I'm looking at myself in the video that we have on the screen, and I'm, I just want to sing "We Are the World" like from the, the the video where they're like holding their headphones and like sweat. Like that's still the image I have in my brain of what cool headphones are. <laughs> in animation, they they discourage it a lot because newer people are listening to themselves so much. I feel like you and I have worn them enough that we're sort of immune to that. It feels like part of my my work costume. <laughs> It also feels like you're flying an airplane. Yes. What kind of headphones are those? I don't know. Let me see. A Sony MCR7506. They're comfortable. That's all I care about. What are you wearing? I have DT770 Pros from Bear. Oh, see, I like those because they're the comfortable cloth ones. The only problem, there's there's some studios in, I mean, this is pre-pandemic. Those are really comfortable because they're the cloth. So if they're in your own studio, they're great. If they're in a shared studio, like, and they would have them in, like, studios where I would be right after someone who sweat all over them, they would get really smelly. Because of those cloth headphones, I started bringing my own headphones to studios years ago. Because <laughs> I'm just really smell sensitive, and headphones retain smells. I think you and I had the conversation about, you know, <laughs> studio headphones, always bring your own because Ugh. who knows what's been left behind. I mean, yeah. it could be bad as the hotel remote. Yeah, disgusting. Yeah. I can't believe more actors didn't. I mean, I think hopefully now they are. But I remember when the pandemic first started, I was one of the few and they were like, what do you use in the studio? I'm like, I use a pair of crappy headphones that I throw around my car so that I don't worry if they break. <laughs> When the pandemic hit, a lot of people didn't have home studios like nope. like you do. So how lucky were you to to go home and be able to to do everything? And, and a lot of people, you know, were, were kind of stranded without the equipment. Yeah, I was super, super lucky that I was pretty much set up. There were still a few things that I had to tweak. The stuff I was recording from home, I was doing a lot of audiobooks and things that where there wasn't a live director on the line. So, you know, I didn't have to worry about my Wi-Fi speed and being hardwired. And I was using a laptop. So once I start, when I started dubbing, it was taking up, you know, Zoom takes up a lot of, I don't know, the technical terms. Bandwidth. Yes, that thing. So, yeah, I had to up, I had to make some upgrades, but luckily I had the framework in place. Uh, people were, I mean, I remember they're like the uh, 
Focusrite Scarlet was like backordered for people. They couldn't get one. Mics were hard to come by. So yeah, I mean, it's great because those companies did well at a hard time, but voice actors were scrounging to just put together their home studio. It took me two months to get this uh, Sennheiser. Oh, that's a, I have that one too. The 416 we're looking at. I'm not using it right now, but yeah. That's copying you, right? That's what it was. It also sounds awesome. I like it. I think it's probably better on your voice than it is on mine, is my guess. By the way, neither one of us is on, are, are on the microphone right now, but it has made a huge difference for me. It sounds way better. Oh, it has? Okay. Yeah. My intention was always to switch back and forth, but I'm using, what am I using? A TLM 103, and that's what most of my clients want. So I just haven't been asked for the 416 in a long time. What'd you take at Hofstra? I was a theater major. I got my BA in theater there. I was, but I was already doing the voiceover thing and, and going to the city for different kinds of auditions. So I crammed my classes in and got out a little early because I was just so eager to be working. I loved take I loved taking acting classes and all that, but I I just was so ready to to do this full time. By the way, I had my uh, my son, he's now 20. I had him go through your IMDb. Oh no. Well, oh, he gosh. didn't he only recognized a couple of things and that was yeah, because he's not. If you're not a hardcore anime fan, you wouldn't know a lot of it. That's what he said. He goes, "Dad, this is all anime." Yeah, there's some obscure stuff on there. But he did recognize Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh yeah, and your role as the waitress on Everybody Hates Chris. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky that I've been doing this long enough that there is like just some weird stuff on there that no one maybe will ever see. But yeah, there was, I mean, I feel like we're in another anime boom right now. There was the one, you know, when Pokemon started, it gave access to, you know, I you probably remember like the days of like, if you wanted some weird anime stuff, you had to go to like some underground video store and find a VHS of it. And there's no, the hunt is, is gone. Now you can just find everything. You've got this long list of things that I've never come into contact with, but every once in a while, there's just people... They know Pokemon, and they know the characters you play as well. You play Balthazar. Bulbasaur. Balthazar. <laughs> but yes. Kind of close. You play, close. You play Balthazar. <laughs> no, but yeah, okay. Oh. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Bulba. Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now you're being silly. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Who said one word? I mean, I, I explained that to a friend of mine. That, like, my friends have never watched the show, a lot of them, so... When I explain to them that the Pokemon only say their own names, they're like, wait, what? You only said that's all you said was because I played. Luckily, I played many different Pokemon and then I played some of the human characters. So I did get to say words. But when I die, they will say she played Bulbasaur and I will be known as saying one word. <laughs> and if I were to list off some of the other very popular stuff that you're involved in, like things like Fire Emblem games. <laughs> And Shaman King, I mean, these these are, I mean, at what point do you know that these are going to become hits? Like, you can go in and record this stuff, but when do you know that it's a hit? Oh, I mean, I am the worst judge of stuff. Like, I, if you asked me in the studio that day what, like, whatever I'm working on, you're like, is this going to be big? I would never guess correctly. I thought Pokemon was the weirdest thing ever. Because, again, it wasn't, we didn't know anything about it. I'm like, wait, it only says its own name? Who's going to watch this show? Pikachu says Pikachu? Okay, whatever. Yeah, I'm a horrible gauge of that. So, and even back then, I it was hard to know what was a hit. Pokemon, we knew pretty quickly. A lot of times, you know, just because you keep working. That's sometimes the biggest indicator that you're like, oh, I have a job again? Okay, then I guess this is doing well. Now, because of social media, you know much more. You pretty much can gauge right away by the, you know, the fans and who's tagging you and who watched it. You can say, oh, like... Oh, no one watched that new show that just came out. I guess that's not one of the big ones. And then the other ones, all of a sudden you get a bunch of new followers and you're like, okay, that's my Nielsen rating. I remember once going into voice something and I was just filling in and they sa I said, what is this called? And they said, super suckers. I'm like, okay, <laughs> where can I watch it? Oh, it's on in South Africa. <laughs> okay, right. sure. It's a job. I mean, that's the thing. Like, we're going to say yes to most of this stuff. Whether or not it's a success, 
because we're, you know, we're freelancers. That's what we do. So when it's a success, it's just like icing on the cake. If I have to explain to anybody what you do, and then I name the shows that they don't know, and then I say, oh, by the way, she can't join us for dinner this weekend. She's going to Las Vegas to a convention to meet all the people who know all this, to know the shows that you don't know right now. It's it's weird. It's a weird life. What are those conventions like? They're fascinating, again, because at the 20 years ago, I didn't know we had fans. I I liked voice acting, honestly, because of the anonymity. Like, I'm not a huge, I don't love divulging things about my life on social media, but it's sort of, or feeling obligated to post, but it's sort of part of the job now. This new culture of actors meeting the people that watch their things is a kind of a new phenomenon. Like, these conventions have exploded, and I I can't believe some of the superstars that show up at them. So it's an interesting world. It used to be such a niche, geeky, and I say geeky lovingly, a a different, they were first strictly comics, you know, and now they're just basically big pop culture conventions. Like the one I'm going to next week, there's athletes, there's, you know, there's, I think there's like football players, there's wrestlers, there's artists, there's voice actors, there's on camera. It gets just, it runs the gamut. They're a bit overwhelming. And I meet amazing people. I, I, get to interact with these people who this show meant something to. And again, it's not, it's not about me. It's about what the show meant to them. But if I can be there representing that for them and give them some happiness, I'm I'm thrilled to do it. There's a large radio audience who listens to this podcast. And I think everybody's had that moment where somebody comes up to them and says, Oh, you don't look like you sound on the radio. You're bald. (laughs) Right. Uh, Right. Right. Because they, they decide in their brains what you look like. But it must be different. You don't look like the character that I think that I'm watching on TV. <laughs> totally. I, especially, yeah, with cartoons, it's even weirder. I don't like to ruin the illusion for little kids. Like, sometimes a parent will, like, come up with a four-year-old and be like, "Tell, t- t- do the voice, tell them what you do. And I'm like, I don't want to ruin it for them. I don't want them thinking about me when they're watching. It's, it's a weird disconnect until a certain age, unless they actually see a video of an actor in the booth with a microphone and see like maybe like a live dubbing thing or something. It's it's very strange disconnect for a kid to understand that there's a person doing that. And I don't want to be, I don't want to kill Santa Claus like that. That's sort of what that feels like to me, you know, and sometimes I'll do the voice for a little kid and they'll go, Oh yeah, you sound just like him or her or whatever. And I'll go, well, I, never mind. <laughs> like, I don't want to, I can't do that. I'm not a dream crusher. You ever been to Japan? No, I'd love to go. Because they don't watch the English over there. So it's not like they'd get to go to a convention there. They'd have the Japanese actors there. So I've gotten to go to the countries where they watch the English versions of the show. I've been to like Scotland and England and New Zealand. Yeah, hopefully more when we can travel again. But And I had to look and see like, oh, in certain countries, did they keep us or did they redub it with accented voices or into another language again i didn't know pokemon was i for, i guess it just never occurred to me like in new zealand they're watching our american dub of pokemon it just never <laughs> it's so cool but i never thought about it tell me a little bit about you know the struggle of social media and i say struggle as if it's some sort of like you know <laughs> difficult but it is, but it is difficult because all of a sudden yeah. you had your accounts you were living your life in 2007 2008 you had your facebook page with your friends your myspace page yeah <laughs> it was it was easy Friendster. and then in in come the fans and now you've got to share social media space with with fans but also your your voice acting community and you know whatever you have professional and as well friends and family so how do yeah. you manage it well i resisted it for so long i was thought oh i don't have to do twitter i have facebook i talked you know and then we started hearing that uh for certain projects like animated shows casting people were looking at your twitter follower number because what it is is it's free publicity for for them so i i don't know how much that's being done but you know, what I've heard is like, sometimes if it's between two people, they'll look at like, oh, this person has a thousand followers. This person has 80,000 followers. The person with 80,000 followers will get more. eye If they promote the show, they'll get more eyeballs on it there. It's, you know, even contracts now have not all of them, but some of them have 
like you're obligated to tweet a certain number of times about it or Instagram it or which is crazy to me because like I get I mean I think this speaks to the whole industry like when I started I was an actor that is what I did I came into the booth I said my lines I didn't know how to press record I wasn't it wasn't necessary for me to to do all these other jobs now I'm working at home I'm my own engineer I'm sometimes my own director. I doing my own publicity on Twitter <laughs> and other companies are maybe counting on me to do that. So I think we're all wearing a lot of a lot more hats now than we used to. And I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I, I certainly don't want to put anyone out of work. There's so many studios that closed and engineers, you know, lost work due to people having home studios. And I love having a great engineer and I would never want to put them out of work. So people who listen to this have seen the changes in this industry. Some good, some bad. Yeah, but there were people in their studios back in the early part of the 2000s. And then I would say the pandemic probably just accelerated. We were headed there anyway. And now we're Sort here. of. I think, yeah, I think, listen, for like radio imaging, that was all done from, from my home studio. The things that weren't were the reasons I live in LA. Video games, cartoons, dubbing, those are still jobs that would really like us back in the studio uh, because they're having to do a lot more post-production uh, when everyone's recording from a different space. Uh, you know, I've already gotten some some push to come back into the studio for those things. Commercials, really not so much. You know, other things where it's it's not a ton of post-production work, it's okay, but it's there's a lot more, they're spending more hours you know, because again, like we, you know, if we went into a voiceover session with for new animation, we, there'd be four of us in the room recording together. Now they're recording us all separately. They're trying to change the, the room tones to all match. They're having to edit it. It's taking way more time and it's really eating into their budgets. Yeah, I can imagine that for animation cartoons, it would be the hardest to do remotely. Yeah. And I was I was going to ask you, like, you know, when you get in there for the, you know, the first time you're going to do the read and the run through and you're starting a brand new cartoon series, mm-hmm. working with the director, they want to land on the voice. Are they landing on the voice you're offering or do they want you to change it? Like, what's that sort of work interaction like on, at the very outset of these series? Oh, that's a good question. So if you've auditioned, what happens is a lot of the time they'll play you your audition that got you the that got you the role. So they'll say, "This is why we chose you." <laughs> um, here, listen, please listen back to this and do exactly what you did. I think that's a lot of the time. yeah, most of the time I'd say. Sometimes they say we like what you did, but we want to tweak it a little. Here's the you know sometimes you've seen the artwork, sometimes you haven't. If they have it, you're like, oh great, because that sometimes informs the voice. So sometimes you've seen the artwork, sometimes you haven't. And that maybe changes things like you're like, or they'll say, you know, we drew the character and now she has buck teeth. Does that change what you want to do with it or uh, something like that? And the first day is always very experimental, I'd say. it, And it also depends if there's other how much you can play based on if it's a group record or if you're alone. If you're alone, you have more freedom to sort of figure it out and play or, you know, it's depending if time is an issue or if it's all those factors. And a lot of times, like I always use the Simpsons example, like if you look at early Simpsons, especially the even once it was a show, but especially when it was just the shorts on the Tracy Ullman show, they all sound completely different. And they grew into those characters and they found them and figured them out. And I don't think anyone's annoyed that they sound different. Like there's characters that I look at, I go, oh, that, I've, that voice has evolved over time when I learned more about her. Now, you know, I didn't realize she was shy. They didn't bring that character description in until episode eight. So I have to find, I have to now, maybe I'm going to make her a little quieter and that'll, that'll kind of stick with her. You know, luckily, I I use the Charles in Charge example, too. like, I don't know who remembers the show Charles in Charge, but like, Buddy got stupider with every episode. You find characters. Sometimes they just change based on the, the writing that you receive. In just a second, Tara and I go off script. We still have to talk about audiobooks, video games, voicing opportunities for podcasts, and what it's like to bring someone's script to life. Also, we'll discuss her affinity for Trader Joe's. By the way, there's so much more I wanted to chat about with Tara, like her live Instagram autograph sessions, 
and her role in the new Star Wars audio drama Tempest Runner. That and everything else I didn't get to with Tara is on the episode page at soundoffpodcast.com. The show, as always, is brought to you by our friends at Promo Suite. Not sure if you saw this in the trades recently, but Promo Suite has unleashed something new. Promo Suite Digital. Built specifically for radio stations, Promo Suite Digital allows you to customize your workflow to manage your digital creative process. Manage your station and clients' digital assets across all channels. Whether it's websites, social media pages, YouTube channels, banner ads, or anything else that falls under digital, you can do it with Promo Suite Digital, and it's all in one centralized place. Streamline your efforts, speed up your processes, and eliminate duplications of efforts, promotions, production, and now digital. Yet another example of how Promo Suite is pivoting with the times to make your life a whole lot easier. Your station can give this a try now by calling 212-509-1200 and asking for Rachel or Drew, or by going to promosuite.com slash soundoff. That's promosuite.com slash soundoff. I'm Andrea Askowitz, host of Writing Class Radio. If you need any help with a podcast, hire Matt Kundle of Sound Off Media. That's what we did. And he has helped us with everything. New mic, new headset, recordings, music, hosting platforms, levels. He helps us with shit we don't even know we need help with. And we have produced a world famous podcast. Thanks to Matt Kundal. Matt Kundal of Sound Off Media. Hire him before anyone else does. The Sound Off Podcast with Matt Kundal. Tell me a little bit about video games. Are those the hardest ones to do because you have to exert yourself more? It depends on the game, but yeah. I mean, listen, if it's like a battle game and that's that's it, then you're just screaming. And, you know, the union's been really good about limiting what we're allowed to do, uh, what they're allowed to ask of us. And ideally, all those exertions are saved for the end. And I try to book those later in the day so that I can just stop talking. But a lot of the games now are really, um, you know, there's a lot of like great scene work in, in some of these games. So, and I don't tend to, to book the, um, big battle league. I think, you know, I think it's a lot more male heavy anyway. That's not the majority of what I'm doing. You know, I've done some like really adorable games where I just get to have fun little scenes and talk like this, you know stuff like that. <laughs> um, so it really depends on the game, especially some games are based on a show or whatever. And then you're in your character doing that stuff. But yeah, like some, uh, so many of these, I guess they're episodic games. Is that what they're called? They're, there's some amazing acting work going on that has nothing to do with yelling. So, so that's a nice change. Do you play video games? I wish I did. I'm really bad at them. I wish I had started a long time ago. I feel like now, when I try to pick them up, I have, I don't have the intuition. Are you a, are you a gamer? No, no. I mean, I play little games on my iPad. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, I play Angry to some Angry Birds version all day long, and I I'm a crossword puzzle person. Like that's my game. <laughs> Sometimes I'll see one of my kids playing, and I'll say, "Can I play?" And they're like, "One person game." <laughs> I'm like, "Whatever." Oh, they're probably way better. It's intuitive to them the way it's just not to us, I guess. Or they're playing online with other people. So it's not a one person game. They're just lying to you. Like back in the <laughs> days in, in New Jersey in the 80s and 90s, where it was Bruce Springsteen, Sopranos, and Bon Jovi. Uh, By the way, have you seen any of those or all of those? My first concert was a Bruce Springsteen concert. I've seen him a lot. I haven't. I haven't watched The Sopranos. It's on my list. I don't know how I've never seen it. It's ridiculous. You have to stop. You haven't seen The Sopranos? I know. I, it's the dumbest. It's a long story. It has to do with like an ex that was like working near it. And I, I was like, like I had a bad feeling about it because of an ex. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm not watching that show. And now I'm like, oh, who cares? I'm just should watch a good show. Because that's the mind of like a young girl who, yeah. <laughs> like, can we pull up the Sopranos on IMDb and look this guy up? Or no, what? no, you wouldn't be able to figure it out. But it's, it's like you know when you associate something with someone and then you just don't want to <laughs> watch it. <laughs> you ruined it for me. But yeah, I have definitely. I was. I mean, I loved gaming in the eighty. Like, I was an arcade. I would go to the arcade and play Pac Man and Centipede all day. 
that was the limit of my gaming. I'm Atari, Pitfall. I loved Pitfall. I even went as far as Nintendo Zelda. I liked Zelda. Um, but I think it's probably stopped around there. What do you do to warm up? A lot of, a lot of that. <laughs> um, I keep straws in my booth. There's, there's these little coffee stirrer straws. There's exercises. I don't use them as much as they should, but there's something called straw phonation. You can look it up, up exercises on, um, on YouTube. It sounds crazy, but there's these great warm ups using straws because it limits how much air is going out. I, I will not explain it correctly, but if you're interested in great vocal warm ups and how to not, you know, how to recharge your voice kind of in the middle of a, a tough session, straw phonation, P H O N A T I O N. I hope I spelled that right. There's some great exercises. I was a singer too, so I, I'm pretty good at using my voice, but I'm not I'm not as great with the warm ups and the cool downs as I should be. What do you do to take care of your voice in the off time? Uh cigars and whiskey. Uh honestly again, I'm a not a I'm not a role model, but you know, again, like water and all that stuff. But sometimes the only thing you can do is stop talking. Sometimes that is the only thing that helps is rest. If I've used my voice properly, you know, and sometimes there's a, like, I just did a, an audio book where I didn't realize I'd be narrating the whole book in a, in a different voice because it, it was the point of view of this little puppy, which is adorable, but it's a little boy puppy. So I was, I've narrated the book in this voice and it, I was exhausted. My voice was, again, I can do everything right and my voice will still be just tired from that. There's just a limit. <laughs> To, to how correctly you can do certain things. So audiobooks is a completely different pile again, yeah. where you'll pick up the book and then there'll be multiple characters in there. Oof, yes. We'll be expected to adapt to multiple characters in a book. Yeah. I like to say that it's a suggestion of the character. Like I'm never going to sound like a 70 year old man from Russia. Like I'm, I can suggest that to you. I can manipulate my voice so that you get a flavor of that guy. I And I, do, I don't think the listeners are expecting you to transform, luckily. Do you enjoy reading? Yes. I. It's harder because I do a lot of audiobook work. It's put a damper on my own fun reading. So I don't read as much as I should on my own. But I luckily get to read when I do the books, so... That need is fulfilled sometimes. <laughs> Do I have to enjoy reading in order to record audiobooks? Uh, no. I mean, in the way that, like, you don't have to love donuts to work at a donut shop. It helps. <laughs> it definitely helps because, you know, they the the cliche is these audiobooks are uh, a marathon, not a sprint. So y you have to have some appreciation for literature, I think, to really commit. It's a, it's very time consuming in some ways. And listen, I mean, I've read a lot of bad books and there's times I've like been like, how did this get published? Who, what? It's shown me a whole world of other stuff that I would never, you know, when I was reading, I was mostly when I would read for fun, I would read things people recommended so that you didn't read the crap. Now, sometimes I have to read the crap. I won't say what, or it's just stuff I'm not interested in. Like, I'm not a big romance reader. It's not that it's bad. It's just not my genre. So when I do, you know, again, I can find the fun in them. I can find the fun characters and appreciate the plot twists. But it's not my it's not my favorite genre to read in my spare time. You just recently finished up playing the role of Joan of Arc on Godcast, <laughs> which was now this is sort of an initial podcast outing here for you. And I'm not talking about just yeah. you know coming on somebody's podcast to talk about, you know, voice acting or. Uh, Pokemon or whatever it is, you know, that you've been on podcasts before, but this was an actual role, uh, yeah. which was done by the people at, at Forever Dog. So what do you think of podcasts so far? I really enjoyed it. I mean, God, I'll explain. So the Godcast is a, was, is, was, um, a podcast by David Jabberbaum, who has a Twitter account called The Tweet of God. And he's tweeted as God for many, many years. He's, written a Broadway show that was very successful based on this Twitter account. He's written books. So he's for many years wanted to do a podcast and he needed a sidekick. So obviously his sidekick is Joan of Arc. 
because, you know, that's a, a job she would do in heaven. So I got to be Joan. And that was, you know, really my first foray into podcasting and working with a company who did that. They were so excited that I knew anything of, that I had a home studio in the first place because that was less work for them to deal with. But I'm so used to having pristine sound. and all, There's so much more that like there's so much more leeway in a lot of this stuff that I was not used to. You know, like there'd be a dog barking and I'd be like, what we uh, we have to stop. And they're like, no, nah, it's OK. We'll we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, but it was great. It was really fun to see it from the beginning, too. Like I I don't often get to be part of projects from day one. So this was very educational. And then hearing what amazing work the editors and sound designers, you know, they put in a lot of great sound effects and really made it come to life more than it, it would have with just our, our voices. Yeah, the music and production was great on it. Yeah, they did a great job. Yeah, and we say if we're if you find us going back and forth between was and is, it's because the project has possibly pod faded, but likely not. We'll see. I mean, these things can live forever. It's not like it goes away. It's still it doesn't there. go. We, there's a lot of episodes you can listen to. Wait until I give you the bad news about podcasting and what they've started up. They've started up now the IMDb of podcasting. Oh, what's that? It's called Pod Chaser. Oh, okay. I should see. I should look at that. I'm actually working with some people on developing roles and credits. And there was a, a situation that came up whereby you're a voice actor on Godcast, but you're an announcer on this podcast. And I asked for them to oh. separate the roles. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, I'm glad that they're doing that too, because I noticed what there's a lot of, um, scripted stuff going on in the podcasting world some really and some really really good work and you have to listen till the end to find out who those people are and sometimes i'm in the middle of listening and i'm like i want to know who that is so i like the idea of that being available so if you get bombarded with emails that's what that's about it's not no that's cool I, i'm glad that ex listen i wish that it existed during our early pokemon days and things like that so i really could have an accurate record of what happened and who i was <laughs> I thought you might be the first person I've had on this podcast who is on Cameo. Oh. You're, you're the second. Second? Okay. I'll take it. The first one is Lisa Guerrero from Inside Edition. Yeah. Cameo's, again, it's this, like, I I would have loved that as a kid to um, get a message from my, you know, someone I admired or a sports figure. Some, I mean, I wasn't into sports, but I just, there's this access that people have to, I put celebrities in quotes, that seemed unattainable to me, which is so cool. I mean, what a, that's such a neat thing that they have access to. Did you always like the studio more than, than acting, let's say on TV when you were doing like, you know, Fridays on Cartoon Network? I really like both. And I liked that I was doing both because it kept both exciting for me. And now because I'm not doing on camera, I, I, I miss, I love the camaraderie of a set. I loved the being around humans because I, you know, for dubbing, we're so often just by ourselves. There's a, you know, director, engineer, um, but we're in a room by ourselves. We're watching the screen. No, I don't, I don't think most people become an actor to sit in a room by themselves. I became an actor to interact. So that's what I did love about being on a set. Now I vary up my day. At least I'm in I'm in different areas of voiceover. So in a given day, I might do some imaging. I might do um, an audio book for a couple hours if I'm working on my own. Uh, maybe some commercial and animation auditions. So the variety, I think, is what keeps me liking it so much. Because you're working home alone, that's going to play a role in your in your mental health. Yeah, everybody has felt felt this at one point, and, and we've had a lot of downs and sort of a lot of questioning about, you know, what's going to happen next. So yep. how have you managed to steer through the last 18 months of having to work at home alone? Yeah. So I, because I, I was doing a lot from home, like when I was doing audiobooks from home, which I, you know, again, been doing for years, I, I live a block from Target. I literally would force myself to go to Target to see other humans, because if I'm working on a book, <laughs> I, there are days that I wouldn't leave home and I would have to force myself out because I knew it wasn't healthy. Again, you know, this is pre pandemic when we were forced to stay home. So I think, you know, just making yourself go out into the world 
is essential for keeping your mental health okay. I, you know, audiobook narrators specifically understand this because it's longer hours. It's just, it's a different, uh, you know, you're self-directing and engineering a lot, a lot of the time. There's very, there's a few companies that still give you a director and that will sometimes give you the option to go to a studio. But I'd say over 70% of audiobooks are done on your own, which is daunting. Because the sound, again, like audio, but there's no room for error. You know, that sound has to be pristine. I mean, I've heard sometimes it's not. There are people who complain. They're like, oh, why did I hear a door opening or a dog barking? <laughs> like, that's so crazy to me because I'm so neurotic about sound during a book. Um, so, yeah, the pandemic obviously is just awful because you don't just want to put yourself in a unsafe situation just to get out. So, you know, going for walks. Luckily, I'm in L.A. I, I think it's tougher for a lot of you guys in cold places <laughs> where you can't just it's not pleasant to go out for a walk sometimes. I don't know. I mean, listen, I'm a big proponent of therapy and all that stuff just to just to talk it through. This is a tough time for so many people. And again, we're isolated because of this job. And the podcast was great because we'd all see each other on Zoom. That honestly would be my that was awesome for me to just see humans on a screen. Um, again, not the same. Have you turned down any work because they wanted you to come into a studio, but you didn't feel comfortable? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was like the beginning of March, middle of March. I, I, it was, it was when stuff was, was pretty much shut down and it was a building I knew with an elevator that, you know, this was like pre mask mandates and I was already kind of wearing masks because I was like, this thing's worse than people. I don't know. I had a, a hunch and I, <laughs> it was a weird situation. It was a, it was a game and they said, you have to come in. And I said, I can do this from home. I have a great studio set up. And they said, they gave me some weird, they said, you have this many lines. And if you have this many lines, you have to come to our studio. If you had three lines less, we'd let you do it from home. And I said, well, there's a pandemic happening. And if you can't be accommodating because of these three lines, then I don't think that I'm not doing this job. <laughs> and it's hard. Listen, when you we were freelancers, it's hard to turn down work. And there have been a lot of jobs that where I do auditions and it says studio or home record. And we have to put that in the su in the subject line of the audition. And so I don't know if it's cost me work. You know, I'm starting to feel more comfortable with the idea of going back into a studio. But so I don't know. I don't know if I've lost jobs. There's auditions I didn't do just because they said absolutely must come to our studio. And this was like, again, like at the height of craziness in a city. You know, like, OK. <laughs> What kind of work have you seen an uptick in since that moment in March? Has there been a type of maybe it maybe it's corporate narration or maybe it's uh, oh that's a good question audio books or maybe it was is there a a niche of of voice work that has increased because of the pandemic? Um, podcast I scripted podcasts. I'm seeing I'm seeing more auditions for that because production couldn't happen. I think people started adapting some of their maybe film scripts or things into. To podcasts. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's like, you know, Audible does a ton, Realm. There's some great companies that are doing amazing work. I think iHeart maybe even does some of that. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's increased because that is work they could get done. Yeah. And you were mentioning, you know, with Godcast, there was a Twitter account that became a podcast. And then, you know, when March hit, there were a lot of, you know, I guess TV shows that were scripted, but well, we can't film it, so let's turn it into a podcast for now. Yep. And we'll figure it out later. Yeah. There was I had a few people come to me and say, Can you make this work? Yeah, we're lucky we're part of this world where work kind of increased. Uh I mean, hopefully it'll all level out and one day we'll be normal again. <laughs> I mean, production's happening, so that's good. Do you think you'll be in front of a camera in the next year? I I don't miss uh, I I, I kind of am happy with my voiceover work. I don't, there's certain pressures of on-camera work that I'm just not in the mood for. <laughs> I, I don't love the audition process of on-camera work. It's changed for now because people are putting self-taping auditions. I never liked the going to an audition and feeling like I was in a room full of people that looked like me. That can be avoided by 
self-taping your audition at home for on-camera work. So maybe I wouldn't mind it as much. That always psyched me out when I would walk into that audition room and I was like, oh, she's she looks more right than me for that. Like I would, like if I walked into the room, I'd be like, I would cast them instead of me. Again, like when friends offer me roles, I'll do them, but I'm not really pursuing that anymore. Is there ever a fear that goes through you that those blue lights in back of you will catch fire? Yeah, sure. I'm I'm a fire hazard waiting. No, there are these fairy lights that I have in my booth. They're like they don't get they don't. I'm touching one of them now. There there's no heat. There's like no, there's no heat involved in these things. I do wonder though, like, I guess, I don't know, foam is, no, because you could put these on like Christmas trees and stuff. They've got to be okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like that you're pointing out my fire hazards. No, they're really, they don't get hot at all. Fun fact. You had an uncle who swore LBJ into office. I did. I, I didn't know. I don't think I ever got to meet him, unfortunately. It's my Great uncle, Hi, his name was Hi, not the H Y, Hyman, I think it was a terrible name. Uh, he was a rabbi who wrote many books and poetry, and he was the speaker at his inauguration, which is so cool. I wish I had known him. He was a bit of a controversial figure, though. Like, I, I mean, I don't want to get into like his politics and blah, 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 it's so boring, but uh, he was a bit of a controversial figure. <laughs> I'll just say that. Did LBJ find that out before or after he was sworn in? I don't know when all that happened. And again, and I think he came around. It has to do with with his views on Israel. I mean, again, I'm not going to get into it all and bore you, but I don't know that it would have stopped him from doing this. I think it was just within his community that it was controversial. <laughs> but I've heard very nice things about him. He uh, is responsible for the quote, it's not having what you want, it's wanting what you have. That but yeah, his voice was amazing. I mean, listen, I come from a family that there were a lot of rabbis and people like that who were public speakers. Um, my grandmother, who's like nine at 90, started doing public speaking. I, I think it's somewhere in me that I'm not shy about it. We know where you get your talking from now. <laughs> my incessant talking. Ugh, I talk too much. What's great to buy at Trader Joe's these days? Oh, we, we do love to talk about Trader Joe's. I'm not a vegan, but there's this new great vegan pizza. The crust is really good. Do you have, you don't have Trader Joe's though. We do not have Trader Joe's. I have to travel to the U.S. to get it. In fact, <sighs> during the pandemic, I had to get one of my podcast pals to send me a shipment. Of what? What did you put in there? Like, what was the, the choice? What were the, your big choices? A lot of spices. So okay. I the chili lime and the onion salt and the everything bagel. Oh, and the everything bagel. 21 seasoning salute is very good. Got it. <laughs> and I've got five smoked paprikas. Oh, and, my gosh. And I'm just back from the U.S. Uh, two days ago where I emptied <laughs> out the Minneapolis Trader Joe's. That has wow. Been, that's been closed because I, I paid them is a you, Wait, do you, but do you get frozen stuff or do you, is that too difficult? Because my favorite stuff is frozen. Yeah, I can't do the. I couldn't do the frozen stuff this time because I was flying. <laughs> oh, oh man, because the penne arrabbiata and the turkey meatballs. We buy a freezer bag, and we put ice in it, and then we put <laughs> all the stuff into the freezer bag, and then we have seven hours back to Canada. And I tell everybody at Trader Joe's that wow. I'm stocking up on my dry goods for the winter. <laughs> Have you tried the pancake bread? No. Oh, I won't buy it because it's like too decadent. I've had it once. It was so it's like this comes in a loaf. It's I think that's what it is. Pancake. I think it's called pancake bread. Yeah, there. It, I love I love Joe. I'm a big fan of Joe. Do you have one near your place? I have like 18 near my place. <laughs> They're everywhere in L.A. <laughs> have you checked out the Inside Trader Joe's podcast? No, I, I should. I really should. I'm not an advent. See, here's I'm not a fun eater. I'm not adventurous, really. So I feel like they'd be suggesting things and they'd be like, oh, I'm too boring for that. I have to say, though, the reduced guilt potato. I just want to know what's going on because they have not had the reduced guilt potato chips in stock for months. And maybe that podcast would help me find out why. <laughs> I think a lot of it's really about how the sausage is made at Trader Joe's, like why they would sell one banana. and Oh, they Okay, I'm going to listen to that. Did, did you did you put up the picture of the Caccio and Pepe? 
It was, I put that up. I have to say, I got the Cachio Pepe frozen at Trader Joe's. It was not my favorite. I prefer the Penne Arrabbiata. Uh, so yeah, I didn't push it too hard because I feel like it wasn't not my, was not my favorite. Like, I feel like if you're going to be bad and eat Cachio Pepe, like get the, get it a really good fresh version of it. Only Trader Joe's could get away with creating a packaged product that only needs three ingredients. He's so brave, that Joe. He's so brave. I can't believe we're talking about this, and I love it. It makes me so happy. My dad once asked me, um, he said, could you be a tour guide anywhere? Like, like it, he just asks random questions sometimes. He's like, is there anywhere you feel like you know well enough that you could be a tour guide? And I said, yes, Trader Joe's. Like, it's not like Disneyland or like. Trader Joe's. I could give someone a great tour of Trader Joe's. Um, I have something sad to report, by the way, about my experience at Trader Joe's. Oh, so, no. And this is um, – so everything is in the bag. And shout out to Delta Airlines who threw my bag. And we had a mm. midair collision with my bag between the tomatillo salsa. No! And, and – which is the best. It is the oh. best salsa. And um, uh, spice, the Italian sofrito. I'm so sorry. Uh, so my bag smells like Mexico and Italy, and I have no idea um, what the sofrito is ever going to taste like. Oh, I'm so sorry. Why aren't they in Canada? We have to start a petition. The reason why is because of the packaging. You have to have it in two languages up here, and it would cost them a lot of money. to. Oh, do- okay. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Somebody in Vancouver, by the way, started up something called Pirate Joe's, where they basically bought everything down there and resold it up here, and they had to shut that down. Oh, that's – oh, okay. Oh, that's a good idea, though. Yeah. But I guess you're close enough to the border that you can drive if you have to. Seven hours. Mm, yeah, that's not close. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm close to the border, but like you cross over into North Dakota and it's like I got another like hour to go before I hit Grand Forks. Yeah, I was gonna say that I bet there's not a lot of Trader Joe's there. Not until you get to Minneapolis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Why do I live here? I'm glad we're uh, I'm glad we're talking about the important stuff. <laughs> Can I come live with you now? I love it. Yeah, that's not weird. <laughs> you, you, yeah. Move in. <laughs> <laughs> Just for Trader Joe's, like, so what is so it when you like put your application in for U.S. citizenship? So why did you want to come to this country? Trader Joe's. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the handmade jewelry that you have. Oh, my gosh. It I accidentally started a company. I didn't mean to. Uh, yeah. So I started making jewelry a few years ago just for fun. And I made too much. So I was like, I'll start an Etsy shop just to get rid of it. And then it started doing pretty well. So then I was doing the, the, you know, the comic conventions and people were like, well, you should, you should make stuff that's, that applies to this, the work you do. So I started making some Pokemon jewelry. Uh, And then I had a friend who's on a really big popular D and D show called critical role. And uh, he's like, you should make some dice stuff. So I started, uh, drilling dice and making dice jewelry because I, I looked online I didn't see a lot of like high-end uh geeky stuff and I thought they just des- you know we geeks deserve nicer geeky jewelry um so that's been doing again like it's not I'm not you know getting rich but it it fulfills like a, I love the hobby and if I can break even I'm thrilled <laughs> Tara, thanks so much for being on the podcast. The next voice, by the way, everybody is going to hear is is actually yours as the show finishes. Oh, right. I did your imaging. (laughs) Thank you for that. The Sound Off Podcast is written and hosted by Matt Kundal. Produced by Evan Serminski. Social media by Courtney Krebsbach. Another great creation from the Sound Off Media Company. Imaging courtesy Core Image Studios. There's always more at soundoffpodcast.com. 